from St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. We can always use more fosters, people to help us transport bunnies, people on our rescue team. It's great cardio, guys. Um, So that's kind of what the situation's been. I rescued one in college from a local butcher, um, and his name's Elvis. And then I got Dolly, and I have Bunny Holly and Kenny Rogers. There's so much more information out there now, so there's so many conflicting sources, so we'll just make it easy for people and have it all in one place. When they get hormonal, they'll start growling and boxing you and spraying pee, um, and that's just not what people expect when they see those cute, fluffy bunnies. Yeah, I mean, my jaw just dropped. These these bunnies are, are growling at people? I'm Sarah Fenske. They sure can, and they get up on their hind legs and they'll box you. Abandoned pet rabbits have become a common sight in some local neighborhoods. And if you need proof, you'll find plenty on next door. Many rabbit rescues now say they're overwhelmed by the demand for their services. Katie Kottmeyer runs one of those rabbit rescues. She is the president and founder of Dolly's Dream Home. And she joins us now to tell us about it. Katie Kottmeyer, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. So, Katie, what kind of need are you seeing for pet rabbit rescue right now? So much. I think that basically sums it up. Um, We have been getting about 60 surrender requests or more a week. Um, We're out of pellets. We're almost out of carriers. And we just can't keep up. 60 a week does seem like a lot. Uh, Is that more than it's been in the time that you've been involved in this arena? It absolutely is. And I think some of that is because people have quarantine pets that they're like, oh, you're not as cute and fluffy anymore. Um, And also the Easter rush. There's an Easter rush every year, but this year it's historically bad. Hmm. A lot of people purchased rabbits for Easter and then just a couple months later, they're done with them? That's right, because you can get them for about 10 or $15 at any local farm store. Um, but when they get hormonal, they'll start growling and boxing you and spraying pee. Um, and that's just not what people expect when they see those cute, fluffy bunnies. Yeah, I mean, my jaw just dropped. These these bunnies are, are growling at people? They sure can, and they get up on their hind legs and they'll box you. Wow. Um, okay, this is good information to get out here. I feel like if people know this about these adorable, soft, furry creatures, they may think twice about it. And I think that's part of what you're hoping to do here. It is. Even today, we've gotten about four surrender requests, one dumped bunny request. And we worked with the family in Ecuador about their orphan baby bunny issue. Um, and I think it's just really important for people to know that Until they're fixed, they might have behavioral issues, cages are too small, they live 8 to 12 years, and they can learn tricks and their names and stuff just like dogs. In fact, all of our bunnies, before we send them home, we litter train them all um, just to set everybody up for success. So this is a lot of things that I imagine the average person does not know about rabbits. (laughs) And one thing I think that might also come as a surprise, people just assume, okay, if I let a rabbit go, that rabbit's going to be fine. There's rabbits living in the wild. Is, Is that not the case? You can't let the pets go. I'm actually so glad you said something about this because this is really interesting to me. So um, domestic European rabbits and cottontails aren't the same species. They have a a separate number of chromosomes. So um, it's like cats and dogs. And so if you let them out in the wild because you're like, oh, I see cottontails in the wild, that's great. But your domestic bunny's not built to survive out there. Hmm. So how can people tell if they see a rabbit hopping around their neighborhood if this is a wild bunny or one where this is actually a pet that needs to be rescued? That can be really difficult. So we always encourage people to send us photos and videos um, because sometimes cottontails, they can have like a melanin issue or they can be piebald. And so typically you can tell by their short stature, they have longer, thinner snouts. And when you see a domestic European rabbit run and a cottontail run, it's just vastly different. Definitely something to look up. The do- so the domestic ones, these are the ones that are the problem. They've been bred to be pets. Exactly. And people are then just dumping them. I mean, some of these calls that you're getting aren't just people who are ready to surrender a pet. It's people who are finding one hopping around through their neighborhood. Yes. And one of our two intakes today so far um, has been somebody found a rabbit just hopping around in their neighborhood. And so when you're getting these rabbits coming in through that sort of situation, when they've been out there in the elements, I mean, are they they suffering during this time that, that they're no longer being cared for? They are. A lot of times we get ones that are dehydrated. They haven't eaten in a while, anything but grass. They have upper respiratory infections. 
um, sometimes they're pregnant or they've been attacked. Like we had, we took in 10 bunnies this past weekend and a lot of them had like shredded ears and um, like gouges on their heads and their sides and stuff from being attacked by their animals. Being attacked by, do we know like who would be attacking this? Is this a dog situation? Um, one of them was a dog. I know there were a few foxes and then we think a hawk for one, um, but that one didn't make it. Oh, wow. Well, so Katie, you, you've got a big job here. Um, this is not your only job. Like you have a full time <laughs> job. <laughs> you, I do. You're, you're yeah. a data analyst for a fortune 500 company. <laughs> It's a, it's a lot to take all this on, too, but I think it's something that's really necessary, and I never planned to start this. Um, I'm 22, and I was like, you know, I'm just cool. I just want to work, do my own little thing. But then I was like, there's such a need, and I was like, everybody needs more help, and nobody was stepping up. And I was like, I guess we can just do it. Um, so it's really snowballed. We never intended to be a nonprofit or anything, but here we are. So had you been a rabbit person before you became aware of this big need? When I was younger, my mom, and God love her, she didn't know. We didn't know about rabbits then because husbandry was different. But she bought me from Sular Market a rabbit for Easter. And we kept her in a little cage, had a water bottle, didn't get her spayed. She passed of uterine cancer. She didn't have any proper care because we just didn't know. Yeah. And so then I rescued one in college from a local butcher. Um, and his name's Elvis. And I was like, there's so much more information out there now. So we know better. We can do better. Um, so that's kind of what the situation's been. And then I got Dolly and I have Bunny Holly and Kenny Rogers, uh, in case you can't sense a little naming theme. And I just decided the education's out there, but it's so hard to find it because there's so many conflicting sources. So we'll just make it easy for people and have it all in one place. So we do offer a free virtual education course. Oh, okay. So if people end up with a rabbit and they're trying to figure out how do I make this rabbit happy and healthy, you're, you're willing to weigh in even before they get to the surrender stage. Exactly. Our goal is not to take people's rabbits if they want to surrender. We always work with them first to see if we can provide supplies, if we can get them fixed, if we can help them keep their pet. So tell us about the difference between this rabbit you got. Your mom purchased the first one at the Soulard Market. Please tell me they're not doing that anymore there. They still are, actually, and they're selling them for meat, too, two booths. Oh, um, boy. Okay, well, <laughs> this is depressing. <laughs> so you had this this rabbit that your mom got from the Soulard Market. You didn't know what you were doing. That This rabbit ended up being fairly unhappy. Correct. I was 10. It was an Easter gift. Um, and again, we always tell people because a lot of times adopters are like, well, I don't need to take the course. I've had a rabbit. But rabbit husbandry has changed so drastically in the last 10 years. We make everybody take it just so we start on the same page. So then when you got this rabbit when you were in college, this was Elvis um, and there was more information out there or you were proactive about getting this information. How did things change for Elvis? What are some of the things you did differently? So he had a water bowl. He was neutered. He was mostly free room in my dorm room. I got very lucky. He didn't chew anything. Um, so my was, RAs was, and stuff. He was free roam. He's just wandering he around was. your dorm room. You're, you're I like, had a puppy pen um, just in case I needed it. But he would like wander the halls with me and stuff. And everybody just loved him. You must have had a good <laughs> roommate. Or maybe Elvis just was a, a likable rabbit. <laughs> very likable. Um, but he has red eyes. And so... As even one of our intakes today that somebody found dumped outside is red eyes and people get freaked out by them. Um, they're like, oh, like it's a devil rabbit or they're so evil. Um, but really they're called red eyed whites or ruby eyed whites. And we call them our mood ring bunnies because when they're calm, their eyes are light purple lilac. And when they're stressed out or excited, their blood pressure raises, they're bright red. And so this, it sounds like Elvis is really when you started getting all in on rabbits. This, this sounds like somebody who uh, he taught you the, the good side of, of rabbiting. Absolutely. He was, uh, you know, he was living outside in a little petting zoo. Um, they decided at the end of the season they'd process them all. And so I said, well, I'll just take one. And I figured I had to had to learn up real fast. So you've now got this venture. Um, you said that you were just, you know, thinking, OK, somebody's going to deal with this, all these excess rabbits running around. At some point, it became clear that person was you. That, that was about two years ago. It was, yes. And just because there's like, and like you said, look on next door and stuff, you'll see so many bunnies on next door and Facebook and um, literally everywhere. And I know because I volunteered at another rabbit rescue and everywhere was filling up. And so we started Dolly's. We helped another rabbit rescue start. Um, and we're just hoping to keep going and keep growing. I understand you have capacity for more than 70 bunnies at this point. Are those all there in your home? Oh, heavens no. Oh my goodness! I would not be able to do that. I would be in a padded room. Um, we have <laughs> we have an extensive system of foster homes, and we're just so lucky to have all these people on our team. 
Um, they're all trained. They get all the supplies and stuff. And they just treat them like a member of the family. And so are you able to then help, um, you know, help them with some of the costs involved through this nonprofit? Or you're literally just finding people who are willing to take this on and, and they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart? So everybody does it out of the goodness of their heart, which is insanely phenomenal. But any supplies that we get donated through Amazon or Chewy, we 100% send those directly to the fosters. So for the most part, all of their supplies are taken care of. Um, But sometimes, like if we're out of pellets or something, they will purchase those on their own. So we asked people if they had seen these rabbits run amok in their neighborhoods. We did hear from some people who, uh, yes, you know, these these next door postings, they're everywhere. We also heard from Julie uh, send an email saying, call the Humane Society. They will take them and for sure know all about their needs. I understand the Humane Society will take rabbits. Are are those a good solution if people find an abandoned rabbit? I don't think they're a bad solution. I think, though, that um, the difference between just a legit, like a rabbit rescue that only takes rabbits and another rescue that takes other animals is that the rabbit rescues know that rabbits are exotics for a reason. They can devote more individualized care. They have a stricter vetting process. Um, and at the local rabbit rescues, I know there's no danger of euthanization. Okay. So if, if somebody can get in with a local rabbit rescue, that's their best bet. If it's a last resort kind of situation, the Humane Society can handle that. That's what I always say. The Humane Society is definitely not a bad place at all. Um, but there are there are lots of places that can take them that are rabbit specific. So one of those places, of course, is Katie's organization. That is Dolly's Dream Home. You can get information at dollysdreamhome.org. Um, Katie, I understand your rescue actually inspired another rescue. This is in East St. Louis. They've now got the nonprofit rescue Lily Buns. They saw the work you were doing. Yeah, so Lily Buns is actually in Belleville. They do a lot of work in the East St. Louis community, though, um, and they're they're for, like they're phenomenal. Originally, Kim she started as one of our fosters, and she was like, "I feel like I could do more." And I was like, "Absolutely, like let's get you going." So she's a nonprofit now, and she is crushing it. So, do you feel like you're kind of creating a ripple effect at this point? I I feel like we are. I really hope so. Um, But I know that a lot of people who start rescues, there was another one in Springfield that we helped start and they closed down just because they were so overwhelmed all the time. So it's really hard to get a ripple going, but I think we're getting close. So what happens if there's not more help coming? I mean, frankly, just hearing some of the anecdotes you've mentioned casually today about this happened this weekend and the last week we've had this many. I mean, it sounds like a lot. Do you need more help coming for you to be able to sustain what you're doing? So... If we continue to grow, we absolutely do, and that's our goal. So we can always use more fosters, people on our rescue team to catch jumped bunnies. It's great cardio, guys. Um, And we can always use people to help us transport bunnies as well. And so if anybody's interested in fostering, definitely head over to our website or our Facebook. We'd love to have you on our team. And as you mentioned, you're 22. You also have a (laughs) full-time job on top of this. Do you think this is a lifelong endeavor for you? I think it is. At first, I was like, oh, it's just a little, you know, quarantine side project. Um, But it's really grown and I love it. I have four bunnies of my own and I want to keep helping. So, Katie, I'm going to give you the last word here today. If people are thinking about, I want to just get a bunny at the Soulard Farmer's Market. This is something that's super easy to take care of. There's no problem here. What would you say to people who are thinking about getting a rabbit and haven't done much research yet? Bunnies are phenomenal pets, but they live 8 to 12 years, so as much as a dog or a cat can. And they can be litter trained, they can do all these incredible things, but living in a cage is like living in a bathroom. It's so small. So you want to encourage people to think twice? Definitely. Well, Katie Kottmeyer, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for having me. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury with audio engineering by Aaron Doerr. Our production intern is Avery Rogers. This podcast was mixed and edited by Aaron. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. 
St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.